Welcome to the Backdoor Podcast. I'm Alex Peterson. I'm Dewey Dewong. And I'm Robert Adams. Uh, and today we'll be discussing the topic of immigration. Um, and specifically what causes and effects it has on different aspects of countries and the world at large. Yeah. Um, and I want to start off talking about um, armed conflict because armed conflict is an incredibly major fa- it's a very big factor in the mainly the cause of immigration um, so I wanted to bring that up first because we have a statistic that says from the UNESCO website that um, quote it is a form of social change caused by a number of factors, the most common being armed conflict. And that's talking about um, human displacement. Why so, do people usually, like, immigrate, though, like, from the wars? Often, it's going to be because it's a physically livel- unlivable situation in their current country okay. if or region. So if we take, for example... Um, like more recent developments in places like Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East, we see a lot of migrants coming up because their situations are just like their countries are in ruin by civil war or war between countries in the region. So, like, and, um, right. oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, where do these people usually go to, though? Um, so it was incredibly common in, um, the early 20th century for America to be a big landing point for a lot of these immigrants. Um, a lot of conflict in Europe caused people to come over here before, or, um, prior to and following the First World War. And today it's more common for, in these, uh, Middle Eastern conflicts for people to be coming up into um, Europe, commonly places like France and Germany, because they often act as uh, havens for them. Um, We also know, like, for example, during the Iranian Revolution, which is covered in Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis, um, we actively see people leaving the country because um, there's a humanitarian crisis where there's mistreatment of people specifically based off of a new regime's treatment of um, women and specifically women in the book but we also see it come from other pla- like targeted at other places there's, a lot then, of, there's also a lot of like targeted like you were saying uh, targeted at religions uh, that kind of persecution and stuff that causes a lot of people to flee in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in we see in Amy Tan's The Joy Luck Club that um, people were actively not fleeing their country but fleeing regions in order to um, escape the impending uh, Japanese threat at the time. And we see on page 8 of um, the Joy Luck Club that she says we knew the Japanese were winning even when the newspapers said that they were not every day every hour thousands of people poured into the city crowding the sidewalks looking for places to live they came from the east west north and south um and she goes on talking about the people that were there but it doesn't even have to be active movement out of the country it can be internal displacement based off of the east like for example uh, the Northeast is no longer safe, so people were fleeing to places like Kwai Len in the novel. <coughs> because, um, like, it was essentially their only option. They had to gather together with people of other groups, and that often causes many issues. That the displacement of a bunch of different pe- groups of people into one area yeah yeah like a lot of influx of people it causes a lot of like economical issues i would assume a lot of stuff like that yeah and then also that leads it kind of like draws into every other aspect of what we're talking about here um so i don't know if we don't want to pick it up from here 
to start his major uh, segment. I want to ask Alex another question real quick. Do you know if um, mm-hmm. do you know if the, the countries are like actively trying to stop people from immigrating out of their country to pre- prevent like population <laughs> changes? Like I do not have statistics on that. Um, but I can't imagine like any country would necessarily want its people moving out yeah. unless it was the people they were trying to prosecute they were trying to persecute rather which um that may be in robbie robbie's uh example will be religion um but it was you know they're actively causing these crises but they may not they may still be trying to like fight to keep people in yeah yeah because it's they still need- a very big possibility if I may, they, uh, and that's also something you can see, like, that's across all of history, uh, more notably in more recent history, because it's, it's better documented, but definitely even in the past, you would definitely see people, or I should say, uh, countries that were lacking manpower, uh, people just didn't want to have to put up with whatever war was going on or whatever, so they would tend to just kind of, uh, keep everyone in, uh, to their own demise kind of thing. Kind of like uh, North for, Korea at the moment? Uh, yeah, North Korea, China... And I'm not trying to say, but they were kind of like forcing them for other things. Uh, well, North Korea, <clears throat> North Korea, there's people actively trying to leave, but mm-hmm. the country, we do have examples of that. The country is actively ve- putting in a very strong effort to keep people in, where yeah. if you try to cross the border into South Korea, you will be shot on sight. Yeah. And like instances like that are very common. Um, I'm sure <laughs> we can see in the current um, riots in Hong Kong fighting for democracy, that would be another thing that would be forcing people to leave. But the Chinese government is absolutely not going to let people out in situations like that. Yeah. Um, like, how, like, how they def- like, they're already like, they would take people in, like, uh, at random even. They would, they would sometimes take people off the streets, uh, whether they can, like, have, have surveillance on them to try to track them later on to facial recognition or something like that, they definitely have to find people uh, and just arrest them straight up to keep, keep them in even longer, uh, mm-hmm. take them into mainland China to do stuff with them. So it creates a very active um, humanitarian issue when immigration, widespread immigration is happening. And there's very few points in recent history, like in the past 100 years, where mass immigration has not been an issue that has been on the minds of people within a country because um for example going back to um early 20th century america people were scared of immigrants like people were fleeing countries because of bad situations uh, armed conflict which is my main point but Mm -hmm. um people were actively fleeing these and the populations of these countries that people were immigrating to were xenophobic at best or I guess at best they would be fine neighbors with them but at worst they would be actively like hostile to um not uh, um the immigrant populations because people tend to not like that they, it feels threatening to them yeah they didn't like the foreigners and they also felt threatened because they were taking all of their like their jobs and such like they were affecting their economy just from immigrating there yeah mm-hmm. and, that, and that's all we're talking in, in a little bit uh that definitely affects the overall uh culture of the society uh and like how people react to each other um such as things to like just common ways of life or religion or something like that where people have very defined ways of life and to have that kind of like change upon you like have it change around you like that can be very disturbing to someone's own life in many ways and so regardless of where, oh. they, can, where they come from even, like even if it's slightly different you can still have a big impact on them yeah uh, um i'm going to have to take a second and i'm going to have to turn off my headphones because they are about to die okay so uh, like in yeah yeah so like in alex's point um, he was referring to people immigrating away because of war, and that and the war would cause, in some situations, inhumane circumstances. But while people are immigrating, it could cause human rights violations just by immigrating, such as like imprisonment by 
unauthorized entry, the U.S. would punish them up to six months imprisonment for the first time offense and up to two years for subsequent entries. And I think that's pretty interesting because they're not doing anything to, like, actively stop it. Well, I mean, they are, but they're not doing anything to, like, you know, fix it. They're just imprisoning people for doing it. Yeah, which even then, I mean, like, it, it would make less sense to imprison them because they're still going to put your own resources, like, for yeah. them. You still have to. I, I would. It would make more sense just to try and like do something with them, rather that's like being productive. It, being. It, dep it depends when they when the change in prison like prison uh, labor was changed a few like decades you know ago, but definitely like they probably it would only make more sense to do something with them rather than imprison them. Yeah, it's just it doesn't make sense financially. It doesn't make sense just morally because there's many international laws about this. Well, nowadays at least. Yeah, nowadays, but well, I don't. Um, I'd also like to mention going back to specifically Chinese immigration, not going as far as where the Joy Luck Club, um, goes, but, um, the U.S. actively, um, pushed the Chinese Exclusion Act in the early 20th century that was, or possibly even in the late 19th century, that was, um, actively... I wouldn't say hostile, but it targeted um, people of Chinese, de uh, people coming from China, just out of that pure fear, despite whatever crises may have been happening there. Yeah. And if I may play a devil's advocate or something like that to that, uh, that has to do with more like the people, um, like we mentioned earlier altogether was like the whole issue of what you're gonna do with the people that are already in your nation and how they're gonna react because people are gonna have like a natural reaction to these kinds of things happening to them oh. in mass in mass numbers. And so they had to really figure out what they're gonna do with like a massive change in society and in culture that was gonna be impacting people no matter what they did. Because no matter what you did, people were gonna bring their ideas with them as they try to like escape the danger of of the war going on in their own country. So mm -hmm. They really had to like try and do something uh, in their very like very abrupt circumstance of trying to like uh, filter in immigrant immigrants and stuff and, like that. And talking about this idea of trying to avoid these um, outside ideas, um, in many of the countries that they're coming that these immigrants would be coming from, they are outside ideas on their own. And, uh, Robbie, I'm sure you can talk more on this point about uh, religious persecution, but often, um, groups get pushed out because of, um, religious conflict in certain regions. Um, for example, we see in, uh, examples in Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis of, um, like, the main character who is from a um, non-Islamic family having to hide those traits because the country turned Islamic turned into an Islamic Republic and there was suddenly a need to have Islamic ideals because there was Islamic dress code and if you didn't go if you went against that and were in, not following Islamic ideals be, even people who were not Islamic in the country at the time because pre-revolutionary Iran was incredibly, it was much more liberal, it was um it, there wasn't a very religious focus but post-revolutionary Iran, those people suddenly had to um, cover themselves and hide what they were doing because they were now under a government that would um to the women, uh, there's examples of uh girls being married off raped and then executed because of um because of laws in the islamic republic yeah yeah and i can definitely speak a little bit on that where in the book they even mention uh friends and family who would have to move because of all this stuff going on and they didn't have to put up with the different circumstances that they were being put into so i'm not sure where to go from there yeah, another and, like. Uh, at, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all good. Um, is your point relating to what he just said, or something? Oh, uh, somewhat. Okay, you can. Yeah, yeah. kind of go on. So uh, we also see at the end of the book, the main character is, um, 
sent to Austria from Iran by her parents because the country is so unsafe for non fundamentalist um for non fundamentalist girls where like I said the dowry payments uh after a <coughs> after a girl would be married and executed um those were extremely common so we see not only other families in the book but the prime the main family in the book have to ship off their daughter to europe because there's just such a huge humanitarian crisis with the religious persecution in iran yeah so i wanted to mention bringing this up back to like the main points of the actual uh, podcast itself uh talking about our main issue and how that relates to uh a three defining features being uh, wide and large scale events being transnational and also affecting everyday local context primarily that third one in which the societies of everyday people is being uh, changed to uh, a completely different lifestyle and uh, how they act and how they dress and all the all sort of information that we covered already and also the transnational stuff of how people uh, migrate from one country to another and all that so yeah hmm. Um, Dylan, would you like to say anything? Uh, sure. So, continuing on, like, human rights issues following with uh, immigration, um, there's the child's best interest type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's many instances around the U.S. where the child's being completely separated from their family, despite the child's best interests. Um, this followed up with Trump's no policy, no, no tolerance policy. And where he just deported or detained all illegal immigrants, no matter their circumstances. Um, and I feel like this is kind of an issue because, you know, they're just being separated for no... I mean, they're not doing anything about it, they're just doing it. I can't and say much about this, That's though. been an incredibly common argument on the subject of immigration is if it's moral for a country that's having people immigrate into it to just deport those people back to places where it's very likely that given that they've tried to get out once they'll probably never have that opportunity again whether they're detained in their own country for indefinite amounts of time to yeah. even being killed because of like that like insubordination yeah. for lack of a better term um, and it's incredibly dangerous, but plenty of people are willing to make that choice because they'd rather focus on their own national security. Yeah, it's like re uh, the right to seek asylum, which the U.S. completely denies for all immigrants, like saying you have um, you have to have a previously you have to have a previous previously applied for asylum in other countries that they have to travel through. Or else they would just completely deny you, so that just completely like cuts off bordering countries and such, like Mexico, Cuba, just from immigrating into the U.S. Well, I think there's something to be said about that and how that affects uh, main points, of course, uh, about mainly society and what this means for everyone else involved. Because even those who, like, let's say you take the people who are there in the nations that people are leaving from, uh, people who decide to stay there. Uh, that's going to have an effect on them, of course, in that there may even be actions taken by the people who are staying, uh, like, we've, like we've mentioned earlier, to keep people in the country. And like we obviously mentioned with the uh, imprisonment and all that, once they were denied. And uh, if I can go somewhere else with that. Although I do want to mention, uh, because of like the contemporary, uh, what is it, contemporary nature, that of how we're bringing up war into that. And how we're trying to and, and, like involve uh, what is it the violence of uh, of people in different nations and how that affects immigration to the U.S. in particular and such. So because I mean it's not like you have the same kind of right going unless you want to take up like a very a very contemporary uh, what is it then involving like certain gang members involved with the government in Mexico and stuff like that, which influences immigration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd like to, because I believe we are reaching our time limit, possibly. Uh, I think we still have, like, we have a little bit of time left. Yeah, okay. I'm, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, by the way, I'd like to point back to the Joy Luck Club because I think the entire book, um, though it's a non-fiction or though it's a fictional account, it's based off of um the author Amy Tan's experiences being around people who had immigrated to the USA from China. And we see constantly throughout the book that there's a lot of mistreatment for people coming from places where they absolutely needed to get out. Yeah. Whether that be war, human rights violations, um, religious persecution. <coughs> These places, there's no living there, and people leaving from leaving from these places are mistreated in other countries yeah. but it's still a better alternative as much of a, a living hell as it might be like we see um people have to like we see um poor working conditions for these people poor pay um bad neighborhoods we see that these immigrants are very much mistreated um yeah following up with like mistreatment yeah oh sorry i don't know if I sorry they're, they're very much mistreated in these new countries despite the condition like not despite but they've been through bad conditions and they're not exactly going to they're going to better ones yeah but it's still a possibility that they're gonna be completely mistreated in these new countries. Yeah. Yeah, like the US with these new like holding facilities, they've been they've put all these children, you know, they just watch themselves. They have children watching other children. They're not giving them like proper supplemented food, no nutrition, nothing. Mm -hmm. And they can't really do anything about it because they're in like a holding facility. And as we've seen, these issues go far back to not only this century, this decade, um, the last century, century before that, and it just keeps going back because people actively find reasons that they need to leave their regions. Um, the United States itself was born out of a revolution because people, some people actively joined together after leaving a country. They, they wanted to seek separation. Yeah, they wanted separation the... Separation from the Right. Separation awesome. yeah. from those countries can be vital to many of these people. Mm -hmm. They wanted to separate because of the the king's cruel cruelty, and uh, they also wanted to free the sorry the religious um, I'm retarded <laughs> the religious um, freedoms and such. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can almost call it there, yeah. Um, I mean, I think we, started, we started repeating ourselves a lot there. Yeah, I'm just gonna like, cut my yeah, last uh, I, No, I know it, it happens. Um, like, I, I, I think that's a good wrap up. Um, yeah, yeah, we've been going for so like 23. Um, this has been the this has been the back table podcast discussion on immigration. I'm Alex mm -hmm. Peterson. I'm Dylan Dewong, and I'm Robert Adams. <laughs> and Stephen Parker was not here to record. Oh yeah. So